Torniamo a tavola, tavola rotonda, chiamo sul palco intanto il Senior Director Global Lead Urban Innovation Internet Business Solutions Group di Cisco, Nicola Villa. Nicola, un biglietto da visita infinito, finito col fiatone alla fine per leggere la tua qualifica. Allora, Open Source Lead for Western Europe di Microsoft, Michaela Kraft. Credo Michaela, Michaela ci sei? Michaela, eccola. Microfoniamoli tutti. L'ultimo, Ed Future Internet Technology and Research a Telecom Italia, Gabriele Elia. Perfetto, grazie. Ci dovremmo essere. Intanto cominciamo con te, mentre loro si accomodano. Delle tante cose che mi hanno colpito da, da profano dalla presentazione di Simone, c'è stata la questione che a un certo punto... Ciao Michele, benvenuto. Welcome here. Che a un certo punto i dati non li vengono portati fisicamente, cioè non, le, le reti non, non riescono a reggere l'impatto dei dati, mi ha mi un po' stupito questa cosa. Uh, I don't know, maybe we can, we can manage the round table in English in for English. her, because she, she doesn't have a, a translation. So we'd rather make it in English. Ok, in English, ok. Uh, it's one of the issues that we have at the moment with big data, understanding basically the flows and from a network perspective how much... Uh, Uh, intelligence you need to basically move them around. And that's uh, very much of a work in progress. We have a couple of projects, I maybe speak about this later, that we're basically developing. Yes, sure. Not to understand what happens in terms of data, but what is the impact of big data on, on the, the network structure? Absolutely. Yes. You, you, can, you can do it now. You have a presentation? I have a couple of slides just as an introduction. And, uh, Leonardo, are we ready for the presentation? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You can go ahead. Quite amazing in this age, I mean, to imagine that uh, you have to transfer physically the data, and not over the net. Over the net. It's, it, it, is, uh, it is one of the big issues that we have at this moment, and uh, uh, especially in countries uh, who have a very limited broadband uh, uh, infrastructure. So it's not only a matter of, uh, of, uh, of software intelligence, but it's a matter of how big is the pipe. You mean Italy also? Italy is actually one of the countries which in many ways... With, with is, the limited uh, broadband infrastructure? Has, ...has been doing lots of, uh, lots of work, has been catching up in many, in many areas. Uh, yes. the, the mobile area is one of the classic examples where Italy is in many ways leaders. Okay, your presentation is there? Yes, there you go. On the other side, especially when you look at cities, and that's my area of expertise for the last 12 years, uh, we're still working in many ways from a very limited uh, uh, network infrastructure. Let me see if this is... Uh, doesn't really work. Here we go. Yes, so from, from a broader perspective, what we've been uh, seeing in many cities around the world is uh, uh, the emergence of the network as basically a new utility. And that was really make uh, a difference between a city which is smart or not smart. That's, that's my, my area, smart cities. Uh, but smart cities are connected by definition. And the, bottle, the bottlenecks in the networks are basically, basically becoming the big uh, limiting factor in terms of... Uh, Uh, deployment of capabilities from a citizen services perspective, but also uh, from an energy efficiency and traffic flows point of view. So the network becomes the fourth utility, as many call it. And when the network is not uh, resilient and is not uh, solid enough, you basically start seeing some bottlenecks that have an impact, not only on the way the city uh, manages the data, but also in terms of socioeconomics. Uh, classic examples, uh, and I live there, is the city of Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Yeah, that for the last 15 years, a profile itself as a city of the three harbors. So they have, I think, the second largest harbor in, the, in, in Europe after Rotterdam. Uh, they have uh, the fourth largest airport in, in Europe, and they have the largest internet harbor in the world, which is the Amsterdam uh, Internet Exchange, very similar to what you have here with topics. So the idea that the city has developed is to say we're not only looking into the traditional class infrastructure, but the broadband network becomes a way for us to rethink about the economy and also the urban shape. The second big trend that we basically find uh, around our cities is, of course, the idea that has been uh, explained in many ways this morning of uh, the Internet of Things or the industrialization of the Internet. We have today more IP-enabled devices than people around the world. And, of course, this generates all the topics and thematics of big data and open data. Uh, what we're doing at Cisco at the moment is we're looking at the intersection between open data, big data, and the urban shapes to try to understand how the city can be rethought 
coming out of those type of, uh, of, uh, of ideas. The third trend, of course, is uh, pervasive urban net network and big data and open data allow an acceleration the co-production of solutions for the city. So we're moving away from a top-down idea where the government and big businesses like Cisco come together and think about what type of smart cities program do we run into a bottom-up type of innovation model which is more based on crowdsourcing and is more based on the inclusion of the citizens as more and medium businesses in the development of the services on top of it. So you could think about, back into what we were saying this morning, innovation happening at the edge in terms of happening at the center of the city from a governance and an organizational point of view. And the fourth trend, of course, I'm not going to go after this and I'm preaching the choirs, is the idea of cloud computing. So cloud computing accelerates again the rate of innovation in terms of cross-sourcing, in terms of edge type of, 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 of development. Now, a couple of projects to basically show a bit uh, what we've been doing and some of the successes, but also some of the mistakes that we've done. We started with those ideas in 2005. We launched a program together with Clinton Global Initiative called Connected Urban Development. And the idea was to think about uh, broadband networks, data, and the impact that this new IT paradigm into the city will have uh, uh, from an urban planning perspective in CO2 emission reductions. So Clinton claimed to us and say, is the net reducing CO2 emissions? in a city or is it increasing them? And what are applications and services that basically showcase that? So we launched a program in San Francisco which has now been uh, redeployed in Amsterdam, uh, in Vancouver, and we're looking at New York at the moment. And the idea was to say, if you think about all the networks into the city, and especially we look at three areas, we look into uh, um, uh, transportation networks, we look into the grid, and we look into all the idea of uh, waste management systems. And we said, can now uh, the data which is generated by those systems, some of it live and some of it not live, be used by the citizens to move them from, uh, this is a word that the mayor of San Francisco used, from collective intelligence into collective actions. If I create a transparency, can people basically take some of the actions in their hands and create some local innovations? So we look into these projects and we basically collected the data together with the uh, uh, Mobile Experience Lab of MIT. We collected data coming from those three systems into the city, we put them online, and we started to see how cities started to play with that. We showcased uh, CO2 emissions by zip codes, so by neighborhoods in all those cities. And we look into how your performance from a, city, from a neighborhood perspective was with reference, again, to transportation, to waste management, and to energy efficiency, which basically means the data coming from the smart grid of pg and &E. And we took, again, this top-down classic government and business approach, what were citizens doing there and so on. And literally, this thing exploded in our hands. So local uh, uh, grassroots groups in San Francisco started to take the data, manipulate and play with them, and create alternative maps, which is great for us because we basically wanted to throw the rock in the water and not really drive innovation ourselves. Many of the groups and many of the companies build applications and services on top of the eco map. So in many ways, we started to create a sort of digital sandbox, uh, not a vertical integrated model, on top of which the applications basically were created. We then got inspired by what the city of uh, uh, um, of uh, Washington did. They created a program, many of you might be aware, called Apps for Democracy. So their issue is that the government will not be able to create enough application and services at a decent rate and basically put them out to the citizens. So they say basically put open it up, they crowdsource the development of applications. And it was interesting for me when they show us this data, say, well, we basically spent $50,000 in opening up our APIs and putting it out. And the estimated value of what the hackathons produced there is more than $2 million. So we're not thinking about the government now cross-sourcing the innovation, innovation again happening at the edge, and the citizen becoming the actors of the design of the services they basically want to take into consideration. And the last interesting piece for us is a project that we've seen happening at the other side of the world in Korea, where the city of Busan, which is the second of the city, has used a combination of uh, uh, broadband networks in, co in collaboration with Korea Telecom. They then consolidated seven data centers in different uh, government agencies around the city into one. They, of course, then virtualize the data center of the network. And then they start to open the data from a network perspective even to the citizens. They run a couple of competitions, and now you have a very thriving uh, uh, small and business cluster in Busan, where apps developers basically take the data, which have now been cleansed, overlaid, and somehow there's an algorithm on top of that. And it becomes easier for them to therefore create uh, 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 applications and apps they basically provide more intelligence than the ones which they used to develop where they were basically the data which was raw. 
So the idea of having this in-between engine run by somebody, the overlays and cleans and put them out, basically facilitates, enables a faster rate of innovation from a small and medium business perspective in the innovation cluster. So these are some of the examples that we've seen uh, from, a, from, a, from a Cisco perspective. Uh, to conclude this brief thing, there's, uh, of course, an opportunity we've seen from a, from a commercial point of view. Uh, we moved away in the last few years uh, from thinking that we could design a vertical integrated model from network into sensors, into exchanges, into applications, into appliances, into looking at our role as a bit of an horizontal one. We see ourselves in many ways as the plumbers of innovation. We don't see the application layer being developed by large corporations uh, uh, in isolation. We see the idea, of, again, of cross-sourcing and community collaboration and co-creation as the way in which we can generate more traffic, basically, on top of our network. So it's an horizontally unbundled model, a bit as the old uh, uh, fiber to the home uh, experiments that we see in Northern Europe, as opposite to a vertical integrated one. And again, the intersection between data, open data, and place making for innovation is the area that we've been looking at so far. Um, thank you. Thank you. First of all, do, do you, did you ever hear about a, a project called Apps for Italy? Because you mentioned Apps for Democracy. This you know, Apps for Italy. This is something that we, that we could be thinking about. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, no, it's, still, it's a competition, it's running. It does. It's okay. the country. It, it has been know. launched, I think, uh, like a month ago. Okay. And it's still running. I think there is time until the, the te February the 10th to submit the uh, application and the ideas okay. f f with the Italian open data. So it's very important. And I hope that the, pe the, the people uh, following the, uh, today the conference and the live streaming can uh, apply and just submit ideas. They're very simple. Not, not only applications, just ideas is there enough. It's a fantastic initiative. In many ways, if you think about Italy, we have the, the background, the humus, in our industrial structure and the local uh, clusters to be able to run this. What we miss, in my, in my opinion, is the uh, smart regulations. So from a regulatory point of view, it is very much of a difficult environment to operate in. And of course, the solid uh, network that needs to be deployed in our cities. And you mentioned before, at the beginning of your presentation the smart cities model. And uh, is there a smart city that you consider like uh, the best, the most successful experience? I mean, uh, like the benchmark where we should uh, look at now? No, I don't think there is one city that excels everybody else. There is no one size fit all model. There are cities who excel in particular aspects. So if you think about the, the city of Amsterdam, they've created a very successful program called the Amsterdam Innovatsi Motor, which is the innovation engine. And they are the best in the world to me to basically uh, special purpose vehicle innovation by putting together businesses uh, and the public sector working together. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, crowdsourcing, you have New York, which is now quite active. Boston has been working on this. So the US side, uh, I would say, is now leading on open data and crowdsourcing. The Chinese are basically leading in terms of planned economy and broadband deployments. I know that the new Italian government want to take on the issue of uh, smart city as a very important issue for the, for the program, the political program. Do you, do, you, do you see an Italian city more suitable to, I mean, to adopt this model in a short time? Well, I would say, first of all, uh, 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 Turin and Piedmont uh, has been a terrific lab uh, from, a, from a government point of view. Whenever I go, they ask me again about topics. They ask me about CSI Piemonte. No, 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 no kidding. Uh, Genova is taking some interesting, uh, interesting steps, in my opinion. And of course, you have the Expo Milan, which is the business excuse to rethink about all the smart city programs. So when I work... The Expo of Milan is going to be a smart city. It's a, uh, a big, Yes, a catalyst. To me, it's a catalyst. Like a laboratory. laboratory. To a smart city. And whenever I go around Italy, I was two weeks ago in Barcelona at the Smart Cities Conference, Italy comes up as a very interesting country to look at in terms of innovation coming from a smart city perspective. And that wasn't the case five, five years ago. Final question. Do you, do you think that the Italian public opinion is, I mean, is aware of how important big data are for our lives and... The fact that smart cities can improve our day life. You think there is the awareness of that already? Uh, uh, we are talking a different language. Yes, we have, we are, on one side we are talking a different language. On the other side, there is little awareness in the public sector, in my opinion. And there is more awareness than we think about in the citizens' point of view. We are one of the countries in the world that has the highest percentage of Facebook users per inhabitant. And this means that people are basically adopting those technologies and innovations, this is, a, this is a simple example, more than what we thought, what we think. So we always think from a government and business perspective, you know, the citizens are not gonna understand, they're not gonna do it, they're doing more than what we think, I think. And uh, Michaela, 
are, are you smiling like uh, Angela Merkel with Berlusconi? <laughs> because we're talking about Italy? <laughs> no. We, why, why were you smiling about uh, the Italian cities, the Italian smart cities? What is why were you smiling? Because I totally agree with what my neighbor said. I also see that um, governments are very slow in picking up the new trends and especially on big data. Frankly, when I talk to customers around big data, I talk, I talk to banks, I talk to retail, I talk to telephone companies, and now I started to talk to healthcare and insurance, but the conversations I have with governments is very limited. So, Frank, and that's the reason why I'm knocking my head. I think the power behind big data is underestimated. And did you have a conversation already with, with Italian politicians about big data? Um, no. In your role, I mean, you're, you're, you're leading the Western Europe side yes, of yes. Microsoft. I work for the Western European headquarter at Microsoft, and Italy is part of my area. So we talk to some of the Italian governments um, on open data, but not really make the link between open data and big data. And how is uh, this topic uh, affecting a company like uh, Microsoft? I mean, there is, uh, we, in the, the previous uh, keynotes, we heard that there are so many opportunities, but mm -hmm. also so many challenges for yes. big companies like yours. How, how are changing yeah. your company? So I personally think big data is a big opportunity for all of us. Because when I remember back when I was 20, it's a long, long time ago, and Christmas is now in front of us, I went shopping really two, three weeks before Christmas was arriving. If I now look around, most of the shopping is done online. But many people are not really, or many companies are now starting thinking about it, taking advantage of this. So I think the full economy is changing, the behavior of the consumers are changing. So we as company, no matter if we are a software company or a retail store, we need to pick this up and follow this trend. So nowadays if the stores are empty, it's not for the economic crisis only, but no. also because people are shopping online. Uh, po po possibly, yeah. we hopefully. And, and think about what kind of footprint consumers are leaving with all of us. Um, Michael, I think your presentation is just over. Yeah, already. I don't know if I need Maybe. this presentation. I, I would like to highlight two things. Um, the colleague from APEC and also Alan this morning, he mentioned something around um, unstructured data, so Word documents, PDF files, whatever. And when I started two years ago to look more into big data, um, I learned that roughly 80% of the data is unstructured. And the interesting thing is, I had a couple of weeks ago um, a conversation with a headhunting company, and they said, we have no opportunity to really scan through the CVs, so in a couple of months from now on, I'm not really capable to find the right potential for my customers. So it would be a very good opportunity for these guys to find the right, right potential if they, for example, could use CVs as word documents. And then what I was also surprised, and I don't know if you, who knows um, Therabyte? Therabyte oh. as a term. So in the year 2009, we had one terabyte data in the cloud, in BI solutions, whatever. And if you talk to IDC, in the year 2020, we will have up to 35 terabyte data. I'm a visual person, I need to have pictures. And if you would stack up DVDs, it would, 35 terabyte would fill the halfway from here to Mars. So this is data which is really unused and not really used by different companies. And um, maybe you're gonna ask the question, what's the Microsoft, um, I, want, yeah. I mean, what, what's the question? <laughs> I'm talking. <laughs> no, no, I, I, 
what, what was your question? I have another one for you, but what was yeah. the question you wanted to answer? Um, so, in this, the third thing is, what is the benefit for Microsoft in this? When I talk to customers, frankly, we have a lot of customers who have an existing environment and who are thinking about right now, how can we make use out of all the big data? And roughly two weeks ago, we did announce the partnership with Hadoop. And as of today, for example, 5,000 customers are using Hadoop. But 10 times more are testing Hadoop. And this is really showing that customers are looking into this. And we have announced that you can now run window, uh, Hadoop, for example, on Windows, Linux, Azure, whatever you want, and can integrate this into your running system. Michaela, you work in a, in a sector of Microsoft uh, uh, related to open source. Yes. I mean, it's, it's something that usually public opinion doesn't perceive. I mean, you live like, you work in a no man's land uh, where uh, between uh, open source and Microsoft. Uh, yes. What's, going, what's, what's, up, what's happening there? So, and we had this conversation before. I think I'm one of the employees at Microsoft who has a very strange role. And we are seeing more and more customers who don't differentiate between commercial software, open source. They just want to have, or they do have a business requirement and they would like to have this solved. No matter with commercial software, open source, or both in parallel. And basically, my role is on one hand side to make sure that customers know what we are doing around open source. So, for example, we have contributed 20,000 lines of code to the Linux kernel. So many people don't know what Microsoft does in the open source space. But also on the other hand side, I'm an internal evangelist because I also need to make sure that our development team in Redmond is working with the open source community. Plus also our people, when they go to the customer, they know what Microsoft does around open source. Do, do you think that open source can be the best solution for public sector? Actually. I know it's, it's a very rude question. Yes, sorry. It is. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very direct Very question. direct, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I can answer. For, no, I mean, from a political <laughs> point of view, I mean, yes. I, I'm wondering that probably open source can be the right, the right answer. I would not frankly differentiate. I would all the time put the customer's requirement into the front. And then, depending what is the best solution, I would go for this. One more question, direct, like the one before. And it, it, Italian, I know that Italian government, Italian ministers are finally considering to, to have a cloud. And they, I mean, it's a big revolution for their yes. mind. And there's, nowadays, they're considering, they're, they're wondering if they should adopt a cloud like the one of Amazon or whatever, mm -hmm. or to build their own cloud. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an Italian, I, I, I have two different feelings. The first one, it's pro probably the pu public data should be in a, in, a, in a public cloud, but I don't feel confident enough in the fact that the, the, the Italian public sector can build its own cloud. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it? So when I have the conversations around cloud with my customers and also with government, I think it's very important that people think about what kind of data do they want to put into the public cloud, but what kind of data they would like to keep in their private cloud. And last but not least, how can they run at the end of the day the hybrid cloud, which is a mi mixture of both. And before customers really make the decision, I would highly recommend that it's important to sit down and to have a structure and a strategy in place instead of just saying, oh, now I take all my data, I put it into the public cloud. And I take, or I keep all of my data only for the private cloud. I think there are, or I truly believe out of the conversations I have, there is some data you can put into the public cloud like open data and there's also a lot of information we need to keep internally um, in the private cloud. And then in the private cloud, you basically talk about your own data center. 
and the own data center can be installed either within the company or the government, or you ask a hoster who hosts this for us. Okay, Gabriela, up to you. I mean, when we talk about big data, we were mentioning this at the beginning of this conversation, we have a problem with bandwidth in Italy. I know, yeah, I know, I know you knew that it was coming there. Yeah. And what's going, what, 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 what is Telecom going to do with it? First of all, Take all if, this if when, you, when we talk about big data, they are really big. So if, one terabyte probably is not considered a big data problem now, but imagine if you have one, 10 megabit per second connection, if you have to transmit big uh, one terabyte of data, you need 10 days. So the problem is, uh, three orders of magnitude higher than what we think. Uh, of course you can have a network that are 10 gigabit per second, 40 gigabit per second, 100 gigabit per second on a single fiber, but this is the kind of network that you need if you are, I don't know, uh, Carrefour or uh, <laughs> uh, and wants to download his data of the day to a computing platform where he can pay only a few dollars per hour and then get back the results. And so we are not there. At a smaller level, of course, uh, the, the, both the, the, the speed of the network, but also the pervasivity, the, the diffusion of the network on the territory is, is the, the main point. Uh, we are in, in the situation in Italy where, in all of Europe, where um, ultra broadband is, is, lowing, is not moving so fast as in, in Far East, for example. I think the, there is a, a big problem in regulation that is it's tough to talk today, but uh, will not resolve the problem of the ultra, the, the ultra problem will not start at, uh, till we will have uh, clear rules for regulation on it. All, all the European incumbents are very concerned about this, and uh, so this is a problem. But anyway, we will need an even faster network, so we need <laughs> a lot of <laughs> big iron from, for big data. But you, you said that the pervasivity is, is uh, as yeah. important as uh, yeah. speed, and also because without pervasivity, we, I mean, we cannot switch the country in a digital uh, operation system, I, I would say. Yeah, and but I think... So, so, I, I have the feeling that for Telecom Italia now, it's not as important to take on the digital divide of, of the first level problem. Well, uh, there are, again, uh, we have a plan for, uh, for um, broadband in, uh, in, in, in smaller... Uh, you know, Italy is a, is, a, is a nice place for smart cities also because we have so many towns, <laughs> so many villages. It, no? it so we, we already have a good coverage, uh, if you look, uh, really, from the point of view of population reach. For the, from the, for the point of view of uh, territory reach, uh, uh, it would be nice if you can work for Amazon from uh, a small village close to a city instead of going to Singapore. No? I think it would be the real richness of our country. Uh, Again, um, we are moving on this, really. Not only Telecom Italia, but other, other, other operators in Italy are working hard on this. Uh, we have plans for ADSL, for example, in the whole country. What about uh, mobile networks? I think that mobile can yeah. be an op I mean, I think it's an, op an opportunity that you are yeah. following the, now. The, the LTE, there, is, there is the feeling that LTE can be, a, 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 again, a disruption in, in in mobile networks, because it's really the first network that is based really on, it, on IP in the whole network and not only as an overlay layer in the network. It's much more spectrum efficient uh, uh, than UMTS, than 3G. And um, again, in Italy we are among the, only, the few countries that have uh, 21 megabit per second on 3G and 42 megabit per second that have already been announced by a number of, uh, of, um, of operators. But, uh, the, the, probably the problem of pervasivity on mobile is <laughs> even worse than on the ESL. Even worse? Why? Yes. Because, uh, you know, in, if you have a... Um, uh, if you have a... a the, uh, mobile radio is, is a tough uh, job. If you have people coming to a cell and moving, you have to plan... Yeah, you, you know, just a, 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 a small stuff. For, for years, all the operators, not only Telecom Italia, move uh, pieces of hardware from Valle d'Aosta in winter to Calabria in summer and back. <laughs> so it's, it's not so, so easy to have a, a, a good coverage that is also cost effective 
and the, the fact that LTE again will help because the way that the, the cell can help one to the other to work together is getting things much less expensive. I mean, you actually mean that you're moving piece of hardware the, the from the north in, to the south the, of the country? The, in the, the late year. 90s, it was a, re, a common situation for operators to do this kind of stuff because you, you don't have um, so many people in Servinia in, uh, in, uh, in May or in July and you don't have so many people in, <laughs> in, uh, the, in uh, Isola di Capo Rizzuto in, uh, in January <laughs> or January and February, yes, it was something. Um, so there is so, an economic advantage in moving the hardware yeah, instead yeah, of... it was very expensive also at the point, no? Imagine. But the point is that building a network that is uh, built for the peak requirement in all the cells is very expensive. And uh, it's not possible for any operator, actually. So we need a, a mix of mobile and, and fixed line. This is and the, the point that I want to say. Telecom Italia launched a, a cloud computing program called Nuvola Italiana. Yeah. I think it was one year ago, for maybe longer. Yeah. How is it going? I, because the word of mouth in the, when I surf the web and the internet is that it's not a real cloud computing service. It's something like it, but it's not a real cloud. It, it's Why? Not a, it's not platform as a service, like we saw. It's, it's, it's a now infrastructure as a service. So you can buy a virtual machine, you can buy computing power, but not really a programming environment with API and all this stuff. Uh, that what is called usually platform as a service in the cloud is, uh, gives to customers. Is, is going well commercially. I'm, I'm not in the commercial division, but uh, we have already thousands of customers and uh, things are moving. Uh, uh, the, the Italian, uh, we have a big problem, I think, in Italy. It was also in one of the slides that I prepared just to, to keep my mind. Uh, in the, one of the problems of Italy is that we spend one third per inhabitant than other European countries on IT. The, the IT budget in Italy is about 20 billion euros. If you go to Germany, it's 70 billion. So to France, it's 70, 60 billion. In the UK, it's 70 billion. So we don't spend enough. We don't spend enough. Uh, Absolutely. I, 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 for coming here, I, I, I made a, as, as me, uh, I don't know if I can, uh, maybe this one. Let's go. Okay. I, 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 was, I would try to, to remember what I have to say, so I say I have four things to say, one, one more. <laughs> and the, the thing was that big, big data, we, we said, are, are, are really not structured data, but are of many different things are coming in real time and have to be used in real time some way. And uh, also, they are getting bigger every year. <laughs> you talk about 35 zettabytes. But th the second point is that uh, th there are money behind from the point of view of, uh, it's interesting that economic schools are making studies of what can be the improvement in public administration if they use data to, to make everything from moving traffic lights to, to whatever. Uh, one, one other point was that uh, we talk about uh, new technologies are really breaking the rules. Uh, uh, these are two pieces of information from the same newspaper in the same day. One from uh, a famous uh, classical um, company that say, oh, we improved of 50%, from 50,000 to 10,000 the, the cost of our services. And the other one from was from uh, a, a guy from um, 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 an American bank. They say, oh, we move it over all our 27 petabytes of uh, financial information on Hadoop, and we get about 300 petabytes. <laughs> so really, it's something that you can't imagine together. But another point is that we, we, we don't have enough people. For example, in, in Italy, I, I asked it to the colleagues in the commercial division, so these are correct data, and, and also, there are pieces, public pieces of data from the Associazione Bancaria Italiana, for example. We are about one person out of 30 in, a, in Italian banks is working on IT. In US banks, uh, one out of 10 is working on the IT department, in the IT department. So it's really something that, that is, uh, is uh, th there is a problem of investment and a problem of skills. Uh, we need gotcha. thousands of people that have the capability of putting together the social capability with the analytical capability and the programming capability that is required to get uh, the, this kind of value. So uh, 
um, one of the problems in general, also for Nuro Italiana, that Italian companies are very uh, conservative, uh, conservative in spending in, in, in IT and uh, in spending out of the companies even. I mean, they, they, they actually the perception is that it's, it's only a cost. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not a saving. It's, it's that, in that, the, that's the wrong perception. I, 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 it's a, I, I have a, an anecdote on this because in, in a very, very important, uh, the first or second Italian bank, there was a, on, a, on a magazine, on an IT magazine, uh, they, they make interview about IT department, and the, the manager of the IT department, the taco is coming from my company, uh, said, oh, we are using email and all this stuff, but now a lot of stuff is going by instant messaging in the company. We like it because we don't have problem of cost of storage. <laughs> From the point of view of this guy, the, the point was, this is good because people can ask, how can I do this, how can I do that? It was not a problem of creating a network of relations in the company, but I have to spend less than exchange or whatever. So it's, it's, an, it's a, a, a cost and not a, an opportunity for most companies. Finally, uh, a question for you all, and uh, I need just a tweet from you all. And uh, we, we, we have been talking about technology, how uh, big data is affecting technology. But we re realize that it, there is a, a shortage of culture. I mean, there is a, a cultural problem. How are we going, how are our companies are going to deal with this cultural problem in big data? So, so to change, change the perception of the public opinion and the and politicians and entrepreneurs about how important it can be for, for, for their business, for politics, for lives, for people's lives. There's a... a at least in the smart cities and big data space, there's a fair amount of uh, vision and communication that the business world is doing towards the government. So there's lots of presentations, there's lots of events, conferences we come through and, uh, and, 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 and compare each other's views on. I think the big gap is to understand the how, from a government perspective, you're going to be able to deploy this type of capability. So everybody now buys in the US into the big data. When they say, how do I put them out? And how do I drive public value from a connected commerce point of view? That gap is still to be addressed. So to me at the moment that there's an industry to government conversation on the house instead of the what, you start addressing this type of issue. Okay. And on top of what you are saying, I see a lot of confusion in the market. If you talk five people what is big data, you get probably five different answers. So I think we need to do a lot of education to come to the point that we all understand what is big data. And then big data is basically what's falling out. I think it's important that we think together with companies, together with governments, what can you achieve? What is the value in this? And not really seeing it as an enemy or something negative. Value for money, value for time. Okay, Gabriele. I think it's a problem of uh, education starting from universities, actually. The, so at, at the end, it's a problem of open innovation, in, in my point. One point is the, the collaboration with university and the awareness in university. We, we are also spending money. We, we are, this year, Telecom Italia, for example, is paying 95 PhD students. Uh, it's not a big deal, but anyway, it's a, a way of moving. There are a lot of other initiatives. The other point is, in open innovation, is really making people the, 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 the movement of new entrepreneurship, of new business creating, it would be necessary because bigger companies probably have problems in, in moving <laughs> in this world. And the third point is also, in general, the, the fact of working uh, with different kind of companies together. It's, uh, it's hard if you go to, I don't think it's possible simply to go to, to a bank or to a, a, a retail company, whatever, and say, uh, ask your IT department to, to do the big data <laughs> stuff in your company. It's, it's, more, it's much more sophisticated. We have the, the, a lot of interesting hints this morning about how is an interdisciplinary stuff that should go together. And non-linear at all. And non-linear, yeah. which basically yes. comes yes, out of the fact. classic corporate view of how these have yeah. innovation. Yeah. So these three points. Okay, and I hope that a conference like this can, make us, can give us yeah. more contribution to the culture of big data. Now it's lunch time, and I think I'll see you all back in like an hour. How long, Leonardo? 2.30? 2.30 in the room. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks.